Good morning, good evening, wherever you are, and welcome to episode 57 of the Cloudcast. We're coming to you live from our massive Cloudcast studios here in Raleigh, North Carolina. And on today's show, we're going to kind of go back to our roots a little bit and talk about a subject that piqued our interest, piqued Aaron and I's interest, uh, with a guest that, you know, the way we used to do it, old Cloudcast style, which was we found something interesting, we, we phoned up a guest that, you know, was sort of new to us, and we said, hey, would you come on and share your expertise? So we're going to kind of go back to that today. We're going to look at the world from a slightly new perspective. And today's guest, uh, we're very excited about, um, Dr. James Mitchell. Uh, Dr. Mitchell is CEO of Strategic Blue, uh, who is a cloud broker dealer. And today we're going to talk a little bit about some of the futures markets and how people are looking at at sort of trying to predict uh, what their cloud computing cloud computing usage is going to look like. So, uh, Dr. Mitchell, uh, thanks for coming on the show this morning. Really appreciate it. No problem at all. So, um, I found out uh, I sort of learned about you and, and your point of view and kind of your expertise. I was recently reading a blog on GigaOM. Uh, we'll have the link to it in our show notes. Uh, but give us a little bit of your background. You, you have a, a very interesting background for you know, compared to the technology community. And then tell us a little bit about your company, Strategic Blue, and what you guys do. Sure, no problem. Well, uh, I guess I'll describe myself as a, as a physicist turned um, biological physicist turned weather derivatives guy. And then I, I ended up at Morgan Stanley um, structuring deals in the commodities markets. Okay. Um, so I, I used to buy power in one European country for delivery the following day. And then I would schedule that power to be transmitted from one national grid to another in order to get that power to the country with the highest power prices. Now, this, this trading of futures contracts in electricity, this helps to avoid, pla- sorry, helps to avoid power blackouts. Um, I then moved from day ahead trading into deal origination and doing you know, pretty chunky deals with power generators and electricity suppliers. And I you know, even made investments in renewable energy projects. Okay. In terms of how I got, got to Strategic Blue, I've basically taken that same broker-dealer business model, lifted it up, and applied it to cloud computing as the latest commodity that is now becoming tradable. So the, the way that we operate at the moment is, um, is to act as more of a value-added reseller. We step into the payment chain between a cloud buyer and a cloud provider. We pay the cloud provider under terms that suit the provider. And then we strike a deal with the cloud buyer that suits the buyer. So these are individually tailored deals that suit the buyer's forecast requirements. Okay. So so very much um, you know on the the monetary side of things less about sort of the technology but but you're really there as people are looking at at computing, you know, we, we've we've talked for a long time about, you know, will computing become a commodity? Is that where we're moving towards? Um, you're really sort of at the forefront of 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 how do we deal with the buy and sell side of of what, like you said, is, is starting to become a community at least or a, com- a commodity at least in sort of the public cloud markets. Is that is that fair? Yeah, exactly. I mean, when we when we first started started out doing this, and um, it, you know, I'm, I'm almost ashamed to have got this wrong given my background i started off trying to buy instances using using say you know like my own cloud provider account mm-hmm. and actually you know get in the way technically in the in the delivery of the cloud okay. and then thinking back to how all of the other commodities trade there's a complete separation of the financial from the technical i mean you know when when i was sitting on the trading desk at morgan stanley i've got nothing to do with the physical delivery of those electrons my colleagues who are trading coal their hands were always nice and clean in terms of they didn't have coal dust over them. They were sitting in an office just working out where they could buy um, one shipment from and who needed it elsewhere and asking someone else to move it from A to B. It's a separation of the financial from, from the technical. And so we're attempting to do the same thing. We're going to allow the cloud providers to do their thing and allow the customers to buy it from them directly and access it directly. But we want to financially intermediate so that the providers get to be paid on terms that suit them okay. and the customers get to pay on a deal that suits them too. Okay. So um, so I'm going to ask a sort of simplistic question, and I, and I apologize for this, but, um, you know, for folks in the financial sector or if you're in farming, you're in commodities, uh, you know, this is this is a, 
a market um, mechanism that people understand. They understand, you know, futures for food, futures for energy, futures for, for you know, for monetary things. But, but for technologists, for IT people, this is kind of new. So help me understand it at, at a really basic level. What, what, what value does this provide? What service, you know, what, what problems does this help kind of solve for whether it's the cloud provider or for, for the buyers, for the, for, you know, for your customers? And, and, you know, how does this help the market, whether it's, you know, trying to help it be consistent or trying to, you know, establish prices? What, what are the, the main sort of challenges that, that the futures market tries to help solve or to help mediate? Okay, well, in, in order to help me answer that, let's, let's take, a, take a concrete example of a okay. problem that a customer has that, that we can help with today. Okay. So let's think of a cloud, a cloud buyer or a cloud user who has a particular project that is going to go into the cloud and they're, they're planning for it at the moment, or you know, maybe this is something that they're bidding out to a customer, mm-hmm. and it doesn't start for a few months. They know when it's going to start, but you know, it's not, not starting right now. Okay. Um, they've been asked to provide a budget for what it's going to use now, and maybe that's going to be used for fixed price quote, or maybe it's going to go into the company financials. Okay. At the moment, the only way to get a future starting fixed price is to go to a cloud provider and specifically ask them for a non-standard deal. If you're a small company going to Amazon and asking for a special deal just for you, that that isn't going to happen. Okay. Um, with one of the smaller providers, that becomes a bit easier. It depends on relative sizes. Gotcha. Now, alternatively, they can come to us as a financial cloud broker dealer, and they can tell us what cloud resources they will need, and we'll quote them a fixed price right now. And they can pay us after they use it, and they can pay by bank transfer, not with a credit card. And it is even possible for them to sell it back to us if the project gets cancelled or delayed. Okay. So it's all about you know kind of like helping to manage your your budgeting process. I mean, if we think of the if we think of the old fashioned way that the CFO of a company with a big IT spend would would manage their costs, the CFO would turn to the CIO CIO and they say, "How many data centers do you need to build? How many racks will be in them? And how much is it going to cost?" And he'd be given that forecast. And then they would buy it all now up front. Right. And that would give them a certain amount of capacity. <clears throat> and the CFO would turn around to the CTO and say, you can use that much capacity and no more. That's it. Go and manage it. And as far as the CFO is concerned, that's great. I've managed to successfully budget for my costs. It's all firm and fixed. Now, with the advent of cloud computing, it's now possible to transfer capex to opex which is good because it means that you don't have to finance your business Mm -hmm. you can get money in from your customers and then pay for your cloud computing afterwards or at least not pay for your it months if not years before the revenues come in that is great and good news from the cfo the cfo will like you if you deliver that cloud computing utility model the problem that it brings you is that it removes certainty so it is much more cost efficient but you don't know how much more cost efficient and it's very hard to put a number in your financials because the price is not fixed the amount is not fixed that requires forecasting um, as it did before but now you don't know what the price will be you know the amazon on demand price today may well be different to what it will be in six months or a year's time and you need to predict it it may always go down well okay if that's true how much is it going to go down and so in other markets, as it has moved to become tradable or being offered on a utility basis like electricity, you've then had this this concept of um, of, of forward or futures trading. Okay. And so, so uh, so everything that I've described so far is forward trading. Mm-hmm. It has the advantage over purchasing direct because the cloud buyer can get the terms that suit the buyer, rather than accepting a limited range of deals available from the cloud provider. But the issue is that you still have to choose your cloud provider on the same day that you secure your fixed price. If, you're, if, you, if you have a customer who wants a 10-year deal, are you honestly going to lock into Amazon for the next 10 years? Yeah, right. like that seems a bit dubious. You know, maybe they will be the best for the next 10 years, but there might be the new Amazon that comes in and disrupts them. Yep. Um, so what you want to be able to do is separate that. And this is what futures trading allows you to do. It separates out... Um, the technical decision from the uh, from the financial decision. Okay, so you know, so if I were to boil that down as the as the CIO of the company that that needs these computing resources, really, what what they're looking to uh, the markets to the broker dealers to help them do is is kind of manage risk, whether it's risk of you know 
price fluctuation, uh, capacity availability, or like you said there at the end, you know, uh, maybe this cloud provider five years from now is out of business, uh, but there's there's six other you know viable cloud providers a couple of years from then. I don't you know I don't I don't want to miss out on the opportunity to potentially you know go after those uh, you know to use those sort of resources. So it really helps them have um, certainty where, where they would like to have certainty, um, but it also gives them sort of the flexibility that says, hey, if I if I made a mistake, um, you know maybe I can I can kind of correct my mistakes. I, I over forecasted uh, the the pricing of a market shifted in certain ways and 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 you know the broker dealer sort of acts as that intermediary probably takes a fee for for helping to manage that risk but it, but it does help the CIO or the corporation you know have better certainty or or you know uh, I don't want to say visibility but but better certainty about what their future is going to look like is that fair yeah I think I think that's very fair and and also in terms of some of the some of the new and upcoming cloud providers you know some of them are very small you know you might be nervous about committing to them for for a three year period mm-hmm. but you know they they have products and services that you want and you'd like to use them but you know you're nervous about making that commitment to them and you know putting their nice low price into your budget in case what if they disappear and then you have to go to someone with a higher price with the cost of moving etc if if you could separate out the pricing from the commitment to the cloud provider that would give you more confidence in using these these new and upcoming cloud providers okay okay i got you so um so so these sort of future market futures markets for cloud computing well you know they're still fairly new and uh the the blog that you'd written for gigaohm was was specifically talking about uh, the Amazon uh, market that just re- recently got announced. It, this isn't completely new. There was there was companies like uh, Anomaly who created something called Spot Cloud about a year ago. Uh, they've since been bought by a company called Virtue Stream. Um, what's the you know as as you're getting engaged in this part of the market in the cloud computing market, what you know what what's the current status of sort of various futures markets or you know the sort of breadth of broker dealers that are out there available for customers. What's the what's that market look like, or what's the competitive nature of that look like these days? Sure, I mean, um, I mean, uh, let's look at Spot Cloud for example. My my understanding of Spot Cloud is is that it does operate something like an exchange, and it's for immediate delivery of virtual machines on. Um, last time I looked at it on a, on a, on a no SLA basis to to allow like for like pricing comparison. Mm-hmm. But the key point being that this is for immediate delivery, which is known as the spot market, hence the name Spot Cloud. Okay. Everything that I've been talking about that is that is useful for being able to to do long term budgeting for your CFO. This is about a forward market, a futures market where delivery does not necessarily start immediately, and so it can be used to plan for um, you know, projected future costs. Okay. And I mean, okay. I mean, even even if you look at Amazon's recently announced reserved instance marketplace, even that isn't really a futures market. Because the discounts start immediately after you after you make the purchase, you can't line them up in advance. So it's only good for forecasting if your forecast starts right now. Okay, I gotcha. I gotcha. So so we're still in sort of uh, early days from a cloud computing perspective in terms of time horizons that people can engage with, ways they can do forecasting, and, and things that I think you you really brought up in your blog that you know are kind of common standard uh, marketplace things in almost every other type of commodity, whether it's, uh, you know, fuel or whether it's food or whether it's currency and so forth. So, I mean, I think in essence what you're saying is we're still very, very early in in the the mechanisms um, to to, to create an efficient market or to create flexibility um, for, you know, futures and, and for cloud computing. Yeah, I mean, in, in terms of in terms of people from a technology background, they you know they, they, there's lots of these movements that are all moving in the right direction. Mm-hmm. But um, it, it is only really since the beginning of this year that we that we've come across other people, particularly technologists, who who have the same commodity style vision that um that that we have and are and are implementing it using you know what we would think of as commodities market market best practice i mean at strategic blue we've been trading on this future delivery basis for uh, i think it's almost two years now but um you know one of the first technology companies that we've come across that works in a in a similar way would be um uh do you, are, are you familiar with a company called six fusion uh, i've heard the name i'm not terribly familiar with their what they do though so these guys offer independent cloud metering, and when I when I met John Cowan, their their CEO, 
Um, I, I actually got really, really excited, but possibly unnecessarily. So, um, <laughs> given that you know, kind of like metering is not normally regarded as um, as that exciting, but you know, it's um, what they bring to the table is the barrel of oil for cloud computing, like the kilowatt hour of electricity, but for cloud computing. If you want to be able to compare the amount that you're buying from two separate cloud providers, it's really useful to have like an SI unit, like a a kilogram, a barrel of oil, a kilowatt hour, some standard unit that is the measurement of cloud computing. And without that, it's almost impossible to do an apples for apples comparison. Gotcha. And these guys are independent of the cloud providers and they use their technology to measure how much resources you're using for compute storage and networking and then show that to you as software as a service. Okay. And, and you, you can even do it for your own servers, your own laptop, and for what you're doing in the cloud. And so you can compare. And so instead of the cloud provider not just fixing their price, but fixing the unit. So they, they choose how many dollars, but at the moment they choose the unit that they define it in as well. And everyone chooses a different unit. Gotcha, gotcha. What so... exclusion do is it, it, it says to them, okay, we're going to choose the unit. We're going to measure the unit. You just choose the price. And that allows price comparison. Okay, so they, they do all the sort of the behind the scenes. So, for example, if Amazon says this is a large unit and we, we bill according to inbound traffic but not outbound traffic and we, we charge for these other services, but Google uh, you know explains how they, they do pricing differently, they, they sort of uh, normalize all that or at least hide it, and, and it comes back and it says, here's a resource, here's a price, and you can compare that apples to apples across all these different cloud providers. That's... Uh, yeah, if, I, I can see why you would get very, very excited about that because now all of a sudden you can look at truly what am I paying for, what what is that unit that, that, that people get, and you can do true comparisons. And especially in your case, if you're trying to help people you know, do future contracts, you've, you've got to get to a point where things are apples to apples. Otherwise, there's, there's just too much margin and too much leeway um, for things to get confusing. Yeah, so in, in terms of trading stuff for future delivery, we you know, we can and do do that now, but we always have to define it in terms of a particular cloud provider's metrics. Right. What this allows us to do is it allows us to, to work with independent third parties to create a cloud index, an average price yeah. for cloud computing across many providers. Okay. Now, if there was already an exchange, an exchange would be, um, you know, like you know, something that trades in a particular unit of whatever the commodity is, and they would publish the the prices, and that would be used as the index. Now that doesn't e- exist yet, okay. but we're but we're hoping that someone will come forward and create a credible index that you know can be used as a measure of um, of an average price for cloud. And the there's a lot of complications involving in how you how you define that and how you do it credibly. But you know, let's let's take a leap of faith and let's say that that index is, exists. I mean, it might be worth um, explaining to your listeners, like you know, what would that be used for? Right. Um, so yeah, talk talk about that. So when you talk about an index, I think you know most people kind of understand the concept of things like uh, you know a, a Dow Jones index or a, an index that they might be able to buy as a, a stock or, or something on the New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ. What, what would an index look like and who might run or you know put together an index for cloud computing? Um, so I, I, I won't comment on who might put it together. We're, we're aware of a couple of parties who are, who are working on this and okay. um, that hasn't been announced yet, but we're, we're, we're looking forward with bated breath to, to it happening. Um, and we're obviously very supportive of it. Okay. But let's say, you know, like once, I mean, once one or more of these indices, you know, like becomes available, let's let's choose a particular index and let, let's give an example of how it might be used. Yep. So let's say that today's cloud index value is a price of one hundred dollars for a daily fixed amount of cloud resources. Okay. Now let's then go back to an example of a cloud buyer has a project and it starts in three months' time and it lasts for thirty days and they want a fixed price now and they haven't chosen their cloud provider yet. So they they agree with their cloud broker dealer, Strategic Blue for argument's sake, on a price of $90 per day, because everyone knows that the price of cloud gets cheaper in the future, right? Sure, typically. Okay, so three three months go by, and the cloud buyer decides to start the project on, let's say, Amazon Web Services, Mm -hmm. and they're gonna pay by credit card in the normal way, using on-demand prices, so they don't need to be buying through the cloud broker dealer under, under this new model. Okay, now on the on 
on on the day that the project starts, the cloud index turns out to be ninety seven dollars. So it hasn't dropped as far as expected, and this is partly in this hypothetical world because Amazon didn't lower their prices when they were expected to. Everyone thought that they would lower it next week, and then they didn't, and so the price is higher. Yep. So the, the cloud broker dealer owes the cloud buyer the difference. That's seven dollars. That's the difference between um, between ninety seven and the and the ninety dollar agreed price, and they they need to they owe that for for each day that goes by. Okay. Now, on the twentieth of the month, Amazon does finally drop its prices, and then all of its competitors follow suit, and so as a result, the cloud index then drops to eighty five dollars. Right. So so now the cloud buyer owes the cloud broker dealer five dollars each day, ninety dollars minus eighty five dollars. Gotcha. At the end of the month, we settle up, and in this case, the cloud broker dealer pays ninety dollars to the cloud buyer, and the purpose of that payment is it compensates the cloud buyer for the fact that its cloud costs exceeded what it agreed in advance with the cloud broker dealer. Okay. Okay. Sounds gotcha. sounds pretty complex, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, but again, this is something that um, you know has happened in the in the sort of commodities markets, other commodities markets for a long time. Um, sort of sounds complex if if it's not something you do all the time. But um, but you know I think I think what you highlight is you know once you get to these sort of market efficiencies or you've got you get to things where you've got a consistency of what the unit that you're measuring is, um, you can start putting these things in place. I mean the the tools can be put in place, the people that provide the service and have that knowledge can be put in place. Um, and and I think what you're sort of hinting at is it's really only a matter of time before this becomes something that's um, you know that that is available in the marketplace, which is which is pretty exciting. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the you know, the, you know, any CIOs listening to this will be going like, "What the hell is this? This this sounds really really complicated." Mm-hmm. The CFOs listening to this, you know, CFOs of medium and large companies, they're going, "Yeah, this isn't anything new. This is yeah, this is what I use to manage my exposure to interest rates, foreign exchange, oil prices, electricity prices, and all of the other commodities." But there's nothing new. It's, been, it's just taking the same old standard processes and applying it to cloud computing. Gotcha. It's like, yeah, great, I get this. And then the, the thing that's really cool about this is that it allows the CFO to get off the CTO's back. Let the CTO choose in his own good time the technology that he's going to use to, to deliver services to the business. Right. And let the CFO lock in his prices the day before he needs to give his budget to the board. Okay. Okay. Um, so... If if I'm a you know if I'm a CIO and and you know maybe I'm thinking about this and I'm saying wow this does sound kind of complicated um, you know h- how do you find that that people should sort of start learning how to think about this stuff how do they is it you know do you sort of go back to um, you know the, the the MBA level or the the uh, you know college level courses that talk about finance or, or how are you finding people um, you know kind of helping themselves learn how to think about these types of things is is it is the best thing to do to, to sort of work with you know somebody like yourself who has this deep expertise and and you're not only providing the service and educating them or what do you find from as you talk to CIOs so 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 in the short term we um we we we're very, very very comfortable and happy to work on a one to one basis with customers both you know conf- both both large and small companies to be honest and help them through this process okay. um and basically, you know, try to walk them through the process of how do you forecast what you're going to use, and then give them a deal which may show different pricing for different cloud providers, and say which ones of these do you want to use. This is a cheaper price, it has slightly different resources for this, that, and the other. And we'll walk them through the process of getting the best deal for for their technical requirements. Long term, we would expect. Um, I mean, that there's already some really great tools to to help you manage your cloud costs, like. Um, like take a cloudability for example. Yep. Um, you know, they they basically look at what resources you're um, you're already using, give you recommendations to to optimize it so that you're not using too large an instance when you could be using a small one. Gotcha. You know, it's, it's it's a pretty logical step from there, having optimized what you're already using, to then forecast what what you would use next. And then after that, once you know what you're going to use in the future, wouldn't it be awesome in the same platform that you're provisioning or managing your costs? To, to then f- to actually fix your future price of your cloud computer as well in the same platform. And we would like to go out and be able to enable that type of platform to, to be able to do this. Okay, 
Okay. So uh, I'm going to throw one last question out at you because I know um, you're, you're uh, sort of uh, have, a, have a schedule to keep. Um, you know, one of the things that you highlighted in, in your blog, you were, you were talking about that, you know, it's exciting that these services are happening, but there's still, you know, there's still some areas that, that aren't exactly right. So you highlighted, for example, the the level of, of sort of margin uh, or, you know, fees that, that Amazon is, is taking out of these deals. And you felt like, you know, over time they'll come down, but right now they, they felt a little bit high for what you might expect for this kind of market. Um, you know, that aside, or, or that is a, a point, if you're a new customer to this space, so you know you're going to need cloud computing services, but you're kind of new to this idea of, of, of leveraging these markets, what are the things right now that, that still people should be kind of cognizant of or weary of um, in terms of market efficiency or, uh, you know, you know the, the things that they kind of need to be really aware of as they're starting to, to leverage these kind of services. Is it, is it, you know, is it cost of the services? Is it, you know, can you really measure, uh, uh, you know, can you, can you consistently measure for things like service level agreements uh, for computing? <laughs> what, what, what are those, what are those things that you kind of go, it's good, but just kind of be beware of these things? Uh, okay, that, that, that's basically a, a can of many, many different types of worms. <laughs> um, there, there's everything from if you, you know, you know there, there, there are use cases where you're going to spin up 100 servers and run that for 10 minutes and then shut them down again. Uh, all cloud providers other than one that I know of have a billing increment of one hour. Okay. Cloud Sigma billed by the five minutes, and that one business innovation alone, that extra granularity for that specific use case makes Cloud Sigma far cheaper than anyone else. Okay. The the cloud providers who, who allow independent choice of CPU, RAM, and memory and do their subscription space of CPU, RAM, and memory, so that's most of the VMware-based ones, Cloud Sigma again, that means that if you, that you are not overbuying on either the CPU, the RAM, or, or on two out of the three of the CPU, RAM, and memory because your application doesn't necessarily fit what Amazon and the other providers who, um, who, who offer instance types... You know, like if that doesn't fit, you, you, you're overbuying a commodity. Okay. And there's, there's lots of different things like that. The SLAs are, are, are an issue. Um, you know, someone who has, an, has a, a very high SLA but a limited number of availability zones, that needs to be compared with someone who has lower SLAs where you are supposed to set yourself up on a multi-availability zone basis. That kind of thing makes the, um, the pricing comparisons very challenging. Okay. Okay. Yeah. No. And that and that's good. And like you said, this this is probably a conversation that could go on for for a long time. But those are a few good things for people to take a look at. Um, well, listen, um, Dr. Mitchell, I, I really appreciate the time today. Um, I think you know as these these markets evolve and uh, people start to to you know have a better understanding, we'd we'd love to have you back on at some point. Maybe we can um, you know talk about some specific kind of customer uh, use cases. You know, kind of dig into things a little bit more. But um, you know, I think we're we're sort of out of time for this week. I, I think you know we could probably have this conversation for a long time. But I want to first and foremost thank you so much for your time today and and you know helping us kind of understand this. At, uh, of you know where the market's evolving to. Um, so real quickly though, where can if people want to learn more about uh, Strategic Blue, if they want to see you know kind of uh, get to know you know how to how to engage around your expertise, what are the what are the best places for people to to reach out to you, or where might they see you out in the marketplace? So um, the first port of call would be uh, the blog on our website. Uh, the website is strategic-blue.com. Okay. Uh, you okay. can follow me on Twitter at Strategic Blue. Um, I'm speaking at CloudCon in San Francisco next week and gig on Structure Europe in Amsterdam uh, in October. Okay, very good. Well, um, listen, so uh, folks, uh, we're, out of, we're out of time for today. Um, as always, if you like the show, uh, tell a friend or leave a review on iTunes. Um, you can follow us on uh, Twitter at thecloudcast.net or on the web at thecloudcast.net. Um, and then obviously all the social media locations, Facebook, YouTube, uh, Stitcher, and, and TuneIn. Um, so again, for uh, Dr. James Mitchell from Strategic Blue and for myself, uh, thank you so much for listening. And uh, again, thanks for all the feedback to everybody who listens to the show. Have a good day. 